that's a that's a real crazy one for people to get their head around. <clears throat> it's funny because uh, you can talk about having contact with ETs, but if you actually um, tell people that you get taken to the moon, that that's insane and that's crazy. It's kind of like um, you can tell people that you've, um, you know, um, someone has come along and picked you up and taken you for a ride in their car, but don't ever tell them you went to a shopping centre because that's nuts, if you know what I mean. Uh, and the moon was a really interesting uh, experience because uh, I was lying in bed and all of a sudden I woke up uh, fully awake, fully alert, instantly, and uh, I was under the guidance of my higher self, and my higher self, not with a voice in my head, just energetically, it's a knowingness, um, was to turn over and lie on my stomach, and so I did that, and uh, within a few minutes I was then levitating up off my bed, and I levitated backwards, and then turned around and started heading towards the window, and as I went through the window, I opened my eyes and looked down, there's a little guy about this tall, looking up at me, olive, dark olive green skin. He's had eyes like ours, but the, the eyes, the, the, the sockets were round. They weren't elliptical like our eye sockets. And he smiled at me, and he had lots of little teeth. He was like a little, little monkey guy, uh, but with no fur. So he had a, a sort of a round head about this big, and really skinny body and legs. And uh, I blanked out from there. And uh, because uh, I started heading towards a ship, and I was like half out the window, so I was like through the window, if you know what I mean. Uh, that was quite an experience. And then uh, I blanked out from there. Next thing, I was on a table, and I was inside the moon. There was a knowing I was inside the moon. So these are little worker guys that came and took me to the moon. And I was on the table, and the energy field was really, really intense. Um, but this time, because I know I've been there before, I actually got up off the table. My, more of myself became present, more of my higher self and my essence was in my body and uh, my personality of George was, uh, was kind of not running the show at all, it was, it was my greater essence that was, uh, was now um, taking control of the situation and so I got up off the table, these little guys just ran for it because they were terrified because I'm not meant to get up off the table and I could feel this heat um, all over my body, about about two, three, four inches off my body, uh, there was this radiant heat because it was their energy beams beaming onto me to cripple me, to paralyze me and dis disable me and my essence was protecting me. And so I got up off the table and I just started walking around. I actually ended up walking through walls and um, what I was following was that the technology was no longer stopping me. That fell away and then I felt the um, energy field of an individual being. And so I followed that individual the energy field, that energy energetic stream because I was actually seeking out the head person in the moon. And I got, uh, I got to like a, a translucent wall between me and him. And he was standing on the other side of that wall and he was just totally defeated. He was standing and he was just slumped. He had really long blonde hair uh, and he wore like black sort of clothing, long flowing gowns. And uh, he was totally defeated. And I said, uh, so now do you understand? And, and he went, yeah. And I walked through that wall and I embraced him and I hugged him. And uh, the message was that I was giving him was that when we as humans want to activate, when we activate ourselves, there is nothing that they've got that can stop us. So that was kind of a bit of a shock wave that went through the empire at that stage because, you know, when, when we really do get going, there isn't anything that can stop us. So that was a really incredible experience, very empowering. Now, tell me, in terms of time frame, so how long ago was this event? Uh, it was about, I would say it was about 2004. I don't have the exact memory of when it was because I've had a lot of experiences since and my memory has been screened so many times. So I would say about 2004. And you were saying that you, you know that you had been there before to the moon. Yeah. Tell me about knowing, what, what's the moon like from that perspective? What is it that says this is the moon? How do you know? Um, how I knew was that the the energy of the place and the beings, and it's like when you're in the presence of your higher self, you're accessing much greater knowledge. So. You, 
it's it's a knowing. It's just there. It's a present. It's a presence, and it's a knowing. You know exactly where you are. You know what you're doing. You have clarity of the situation, and uh, yeah, it's just a knowing. I, I, it's hard to explain. Can I ask you? Have you ever seen any other human beings on, on the moon when you have had these kinds of experiences in the past? Are you always the only human, or, or are there other humans? No, there are other humans on the moon, and the ruling elite. Some members of the ruling elite go there for holidays. And you've encountered them in the same kind of uh, outer body or dream type? It wasn't out of body or dream. It, my physical body was taken to the moon. Okay, so yeah. you're, you're physically embodied. Yeah. Tell me more about the beings. So you said there was a small being who watched you at first. They were all like, they all looked the same. Yeah, they're like little worker guys. Little, little, you know, there's an old folklore tale saying little green men from the moon, you know. And uh, I wondered about that. And uh, it really is, yeah, I now understand where that fol folklore story actually came from. You, you describe the uh, dynamic between yourself and these extraterrestrials as mm. a challenge or a struggle in the sense that um, you're, you're reclaiming your autonomy before them was an important part of this story. Your independence, your will to, to do as you wish, even under those conditions. Is, would you describe all of the encounters with these beings as that sort of same kind of antagonism? Uh, like, you know, there's a power dynamic, they, they're trying to control you in a, in a way? Yeah, well, this, this particular group is controlling the human race in a really, really big way. The moon is the mechanical device and the energetic uh, and technologies that are based on the moon are influencing and affecting and controlling humanity in a really great way. So um, the role I'm playing here was to you know, be taken to the moon and, uh, and to give those guys a message, just to send them a message to say, hey, you know what, we're actually letting you do this to us. And, and when we activate, there isn't anything you can do that can stop us. Tell me more about their methods of control and the, and the technologies that they are using from the moon. Well, what they've got is like this interesting bio-organic computer with very powerful artificial intelligence in it, and it actually monitors all our thoughts. Our, our, all of our brains are plugged into an invisible internet that you cannot see, and all our brains are biological computers, biological transceivers. And so it monitors all, all your feelings, all your thoughts, feelings, emotions, all our insecurities, and we're tracked individually by our basic frequency. Every person's got their own frequency that they emanate. So they don't need a tracking device of any kind. It's just our, our actual frequency emanation that is our individual identity, you know, an, identity an identification tag, you could put it this way, and that's how they track us. So if they want to influence somebody in a particular way, they can just focus on that frequency. It's kind of like you look for an IP address, I suppose, on our level of internet that we have here, and then you know that's where the focus goes because that's where the address is. So it's the same thing. Thing. Same principle, you know, we have our unique frequency, which is our, our location address, and then inside the matrix, and then they can influence people, they can beam uh, specific energies into a person. Tell me more about their long-term agenda. What, why, why do they want to control us? What is their objective? The reason why they want to control us is because they see us as a resource and they want to continue to feed off us because we access more life force than any other race in the universe because we are a fractal of the universe itself. So I'm hearing you say in, in ways that we're, we have all this potential but we're unaware of our true potential and through the ch these challenging experiences that you've encountered, it's been part of an awakening for you? It's been part of a big awakening for me. and uh, and. The ultimate story about all this is that we came here to this planet and we actually allowed them to do this to us. So from a much higher perspective now looking at it is you could say what we call the forces of darkness and limitation. We let them come here and do this to us because we wanted to be challenged by them. So in a kind of weird sort of way, um, they're in service to us. They don't see it, sorry to cut you off, but they do not see it that way, of course. They do now, some of them, uh, at the top, they do understand that and they do see it that way. There are members within that structure that do have uh, quite a bit of wisdom and, and understand what's going on, but there are many others that are just so blinded by their own ego and their own self-serving glamour that they just don't see it that way and, and they see us as really pathetic, lowly humans and are just a resource to be fed, fed off. Going back to your point earlier that it's in our interest to accept this challenge to, and to overcome it. Uh, mm. Tell me more about that, uh, this position that we're in, that we're, you know, we're not playing our potential. Uh, we, we, to, 
Yeah, we are actually in the process of reclaiming our sovereignty. So it's gotten to the point in time in, in the um, evolutionary cycle, for want of a better term, but it is a life cycle, and we're right at the very end of this life cycle. And uh, now we're in the process of reclaiming our sovereignty. And it's a, you can see it's this revolution that's taking place all around the world, this awakening from within, and it's a really beautiful thing. And we're reclaiming our individual sovereignty, we're reclaiming sovereignty uh, on, on a collective human level, Level, and we're reclaiming sovereignty over this planet. This is our planet, not theirs. This is our home. Great. All right. I've met my 10 minute um, requirement. Do you have any additional comments that you'd like to add before we move on? Well, I would just like people to know just how powerful we are. We, we truly are a um, uh, universal creators of love and light um, in the making. We, we're about to graduate and become and achieve our intended outcome. Devil man's a lost enemy. Devil man's a lost enemy. Heard them take our sword. Fears the little skull. Yes, the little skull. Oath keeping your promise. Oath you been your bond. Answer compassion. Answer compassion. We'll be asked if I've had a cross. Be asked the forefather of God. Human guise gave that murder. Orphans I face. They possess the law. Hear me, guys, get back now. Orphans I face. They possess the law. The first thing I'd like to ask you in the material that we revealed, yeah. is there anything that gave you a visceral response? Did you have any strong feeling responses to any message in particular? Um, yeah, quite a few of them actually. Yeah. Um, the first one uh, says, "Devil's man's a lost. Devil man's a lost enemy." Uh, I feel it has two references for me, two meanings, and for me, it's like there is um, uh, people have forgotten uh, exactly where the enemy is, and uh, in a sense, you know. Um, in reference to like a dark energy uh, and I've been sharing the information about the beings that live on the moon and a, and a being that lives in the moon so I've been sharing about that information and, um, and people have forgotten a lot of people feel that the moon is a wonderful thing and, uh, and I've been trying to share with people that the moon is no longer a wonderful thing and has been actually used to oppress uh, the divine feminine and therefore the human race and also um, the other meaning that it has for me is that the um, the the energy um, in a positive sense has gone missing and has allowed um, when I talk about the true sacrifice of the Christ um, uh, People have to look into my work to, to, to listen to what I, what I say about that. But having that being, having um, being nailed to that symbol of the crucifix being the sword in the ground, the sword in the stone, um, meaning that um, when he died, so died the uh, wisdom uh, and truth and logos, which is what the sword represents. And so it was the, uh, the male, the, the good male energy taking a step back and, uh, and allowing darkness to, to ravage uh, the Divine Feminine here. So that's what that um, reference is to, that the devil, so to speak, uh, for want of a better term, has uh, 
uh, its enemy has gone missing because the true sacrifice of the Christ was for him to die a man and enter the the re reincarnational cycle and so the embodied consciousness of the Christ consciousness the embodiment um, was no longer around to protect humanity to protect the planet and um, and they've, they've been searching they, they know that that entity that that being entered the reincarnational cycle entered the matrix and because he did that to, to change it from the inside out and uh, so he entered the, what's known as the, the matrix of the behest and, um, and has been reincarnating ever since. That's my understanding that they're, they're my knowings and, uh, and they've been looking for this being for a very long time. So we yeah. the, the, the word enemy, you know, it talks about an adversarial situation. The yeah. story about the moon that you told talked about um, a situation involving conflict. So uh, it, it was an interesting theme. Um, I, I think there's, there's more this kind of adversarial conflict is described in, in the transcript. Why don't you go ahead and tell me more about uh, other visceral messages that you saw up here? Were there other messages that had similar you know, feeling response to you? Sure. Um, heard them take our sword. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's very powerful because, you know, obviously I'm wearing the sword symbol and I say that I'm a sword carrier. There's many of us here on the planet. Uh, each time someone speaks real truth, they're wielding the sword in that moment. So it's not really just an individual thing. Um, everybody's, uh, everybody's got it. It's not just about me who's got it. Um, but for a long time we've... Um, we haven't had access to the real truth of life. And uh, we haven't had access to the sword. You know, when Arthur finished with it, he had to hand it back to the Lady of the Lake, the Divine Feminine, to, um, to keep it safe for us. Um, and so, you know, if you look at Helen and of Troy, and the key, she was the keeper of the sword, you know, she was the keeper of the wisdom and the knowledge. And throughout the ages, it's been the, the feminine that's been the keeper of the knowledge because the consciousness of this planet is feminine. It's a divine feminine energy. So um, the gatekeepers from this reality into the true light are, are women, are the gatekeepers. That's why you have the women's secret women's business in the Australian Aborigines. That's why you have the medicine women um, of, of a lot of native cultures all around the world. They are the real keepers of the knowledge. So. They did take our sword, and um, and we are now in the process of retrieving it. All right, very good. Um, give me more. What's another visceral message for you? Okay, uh, oath keeping your promise. That is uh, for me very very significant because uh, if people look back over my talks, I often say that um, they've forgotten the agreement that we had with them, meaning the forces of darkness and the forces of limitation, that uh, the agreement was that we will let you come here and do this to us. And they've forgotten that agreement. And now that we're telling them it's time to go, they don't want to let go. Uh, they're addicted to us, they're addicted to feeding off us, and, um, and that's the situation. They, they, they've forgotten the promise that they made, that they would come here and they would challenge us in the way they have for a certain amount of time, and then they, well, they would have to go. And for me, that is really spot on. Oath keeping your promise, it's the forgotten promise. Keep going, uh, what, is there any more visceral material? Oh, of course there is, yeah. Okay, answer, compassion. Yep, for us, the answer is compassion. If um, you see, we contracted these beings to come and do this to us for a much greater aspect of, you know, we were talking about the collective human soul here, so the collective human soul needed to be challenged. So we needed these forces of darkness and limitation to come and challenge the collective human soul. So we all wanted this challenge here. And, um, and the answer to, uh, to these guys' compassion, it's not to um, treat them now with, with aggression. Um, and hostility and resentment and all that, those sorts of things. Uh, what we're being taught here is to um, love one's enemy. And we're teaching them the same thing. We are teaching them that um, we love them no matter what they have done to us, we will always love them. 
So the answer uh, for us to be free from this matrix, to be free from oppression, uh, both physically and spiritually, is, uh, is, is compassion. That is definitely the answer. So, so if I could ask you just to, while we're here at this point in the transcript, to step back now, the context in which the messages were revealed was the story about the moon, and your, your voyage to the moon. Yes. And the conflict that you faced there. Yep. So um, can, can you help me to frame, you know, you know the, the, the adversary, the enemy, um, reclaiming your sword um, and, and, and a promise, like in terms of an agreement? In terms, of the, in terms of the entities in the moon that you were interacting with in that situation where you uh, asserted your sword? Yeah, because... Um... I've got a great deal of responsibility here. I'm part of the Syrian Council and I'm part of the Galactic Council and I've come to incarnate. There's many beings here that are playing those roles here. Uh, all, the, all, all the hierarchical structure, all the management team of this galaxy and, uh, and all the star systems and many races out there, everyone's incarnate here right now. So I'm just playing my little role in the, in the greater scheme of things. And uh, we have a long history with these people on a galactic level in, in the uh, cosmic soap opera, if you want to put it that way. And um, so the, these are kind of like we've been at loggerheads um, in many realities, in many domains for a very long period of time. And so we're just sorting ourselves out in this reality, in this domain. So I needed to go to the moon. And, you know, they've taken me there many times and they've done some really horrible and unsavory things to me. And this time I didn't allow that to happen um, because I activated my, my greater essence and it was just showing them that you know yes you've tortured me yes you've hurt me but I still love you and that's why I walked through that wall and I hugged him and I emanated love into that being because I wanted to show them that uh, we don't hold resentment we don't harbour resentment okay we didn't like what they did to us on one level but we're very grateful for it because without the challenges the moon and the beings in the moon have provided, provided for us we would never have had this environment here on this earth, our Earth Mother, for us to incarnate and be challenged to the degree that we have been. So it's been an incredible, incredible learning experience. So they've served us greatly, and and it's the, it's about acknowledging that. It's about not being childish about it and being reactive to someone that does something negative to you. It's about being a, a being of great wisdom and and understanding what negativity means and how it serves us. Let's, let's continue if we can. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Got to answer compassionate. These other two, if anything is visceral for you. Yeah. Well, the next one is, uh, we'll be asked if I've had a cross. Well, for me, you know, I get emails and, and things. Some people think, you know, I'm the, the Christ and all that. I just say to people, I don't want to play that game. And, um, you know, there's about uh, at least 150,000 Jesus Christ on the planet at the moment. So uh, I say to people, it will be revealed when the time comes. When the veil lifts, everybody's going to be able to identify who that being is on the planet and, uh, and all will be revealed and, and that being will be known. And, and the last one, is there anything else? Yeah, uh, human guys gave that murder, orphans I face, atheist they possess the law. Um, they possess the law. Yeah, I... Human guys, that, that for me is a really good one because... They've managed to infiltrate the human race and put their, um, their people under the guise of the human form in positions of power in order to control us. So I think that, uh, for me, that, that speaks volumes in that area there. Um, because it's the human guise that uh, has been issuing the orders for, um, for wars in the past and so and, and things like the Inquisition and things like I mean the, the murders that have taken place on our planet throughout the ages under the uh, control of, uh, of these entities has just been horrendous so um, the human guys that gave, gave that murder uh, for me that's how I see that statement yeah and then orphans uh, atheist uh, they possess the law um, it's not what I heard um, I heard that uh, orphans, atheists, uh, I possess the law, meaning that uh, I possess the law, you possess the law, and uh, it's to all the people that are atheists and all the people that are um, the orphaned one, I don't quite 
No, yeah, but the atheist one to me and that we possess the law is really, really important. Each one of us possesses the law and it's not LAW law, it's LORE law um, because law, LORE is uh, the natural unfoldment of life whereas LAW is a synthetic over authoritarian construct which is overlaid over the, the, the top of the natural order of life. So um, I've gone from universal law LAW to universal law LORE because now I'm just um, flowing with the natural unfoldment of life and that is far more powerful that type of law than the LAW because the LAW one is based on fear and authoritarianism where LRE is based on authenticity and natural emanation of one's essence of oneself and of one's expression of life and unfoldment of life with the total unity and synchronicity and harmony and love with everything and everyone around the self. Well, th this, this was the end of that transcript, but I felt that in, in some ways it, it sort of, you know, it opened avenues into exploration. In other words, there wasn't anything final about this transcript. It, seemed, it just seemed that it offered an insight into some different levels of the storytelling that you were sharing, at least from my perspective. Yeah. Um, you know, which meant that you and I could possibly have further conversations on a variety of topics. But just to speak to some of the themes that um, I I've identified and to continue with your feedback, you know, there's the adversary, there's um, the sword, uh, you know, the, the self-determination. Uh, uh, um, there's a couple that we, we will need to talk about a little bit more here as well. An oath or a contract mm. and, and, and uh, being uh, maintaining the integrity of our agreements. Mm. And uh, the cross, which was an interesting, you know, it was sort of messianic. Yeah. But it also talked about someone who had suffered when I saw that, and I thought that was interesting. Yeah, bearing the cross, okay, yeah, I have suffered a lot in this life and I, I've bared my own cross, definitely, yeah. And, and, and finally, the idea of the guise or deception. Yeah. Just, you know, uh, a veil of deception, a veil of ignorance. The human guise of these beings and these entities, yeah, it's been quite deceptive over a long period of time. Let, yeah. Let me go into uh, the, the ones that we've not covered, mm -hmm. just quickly, just to elaborate. Okay, the little skull. So this image of a skull uh, is interesting, uh, symbolically or otherwise, uh, it could be a child's skull. It could be the little entity who is standing outside the window. It could be a symbol, or it could be, uh, or it could represent something. Uh, crystal skull, maybe. Person. Maybe some, you know, maybe some knowledge in the crystal skull that's hidden. No, oh, yeah, I'm just, I just. Well, we're, we're yeah. Exactly. yeah, yeah. A skull is a symbol. Can be a symbol of death and transition or mm. initiation. Mm. And it's talking about here is talking about fear. And I don't know if, um, I have to inquire if, uh, you, you, because, I, I, and because I'm also not intimately familiar with every aspect of your story, are there other is, issues pertaining to death? Uh, either near death for yourself or those around you uh, in your personal history? Oh yeah, well I've been tortured many times in this life through very, from various different groups, so I've been taken to that point of near death uh, on many occasions. There have been many attempts on my life as well um, by ET races and by um, groups on the planet because they knew that there was going to come a time that I would get up and have a say and they wanted to stop me from doing that, but because I'm in universal loyal LORE, then you know I have an intended outcome of my soul's journey here and I'm a part of the outcome of this reality so whatever they think they can do they actually cannot achieve so and it's the same with you and it's the same with people who are listening to this everybody who's listening to this is still here simply because they're supposed to be still here it's in their soul contract for them to be here so no one can take people out if it's in their journey to see it through with the uh, with mother earth what, what if the little skull represents you as a child going through an intense experience? It could do because um, my um, negative experiences as far back as I can remember go back to about the age of five, the age of six anyway. So um, I was terribly frightened back then and I feel that the, what they were doing to me was because they were terribly frightened of me. So what I'd like to reflect back to you is that the, the theme of the little skull in the sense that the skull is an image of initiation describes um, childhood traumas that were initiatory or awakening for you, although they were traumatic. Mm. Well, there was an empowerment through that, through surviving them for you. And maybe you could elaborate on that a little bit for me. 
Um, I think you've summed it up really well there. Um, how much can I elaborate more than what you've said? Because you you really summed it up beautifully, and, and there was a lot of trauma involved. It it, um, it put a lot of programs into me from a very young age, which uh, I was only able to um, I would say transmute and uh, and move on from only up until a few years ago. So a lot of fear programs that were well entrenched into me from a very young age because of all the trauma I experienced from such a young age. Um, the other one that we want to look a little closer at, and I think maybe re relevant, is the theme about orphans, which you know can mean an abandoned child or someone who's felt that they were abandoned. Perhaps through those traumatic experiences, they were isolating for you in different ways? Yeah, orphans also can mean... Um, I know you, you're using it, using the personal context, and I agree with the statement you've just made. It, yeah, that's that's definitely a possibility. Um, as you were speaking about it, then what came to me was about how people feel that they've been abandoned here. Now, a lot of people have that orphan archetype within them, how they're here and they're not happy here and they don't feel comfortable here and they just want to go home, you know, and they do feel this uh, sense of abandonment by actually existing in this reality, abandonment by our true family in the true light where, you know, where things are uh, fulfilling and, and nurturing and loving and caring. So one thing I'm gathering from our conversation is that the, uh, the trials of your life that you experienced, that you've, you've been able to identify um, universal themes, in other words, that the difficulties that you faced were tied into universal dramas that this, our human society, civilization, and evolution is, is up against as well. And in some ways, yeah. you've succeeded or advanced beyond the, the conflicts. Yeah, the, yeah, because a theme emerged. Uh, when I looked back, I went through a dark night of the soul, which lasted about 10 years, and and I worked very difficult, very diligently, and and went through very difficult times, uh, working on myself to really work out why I had to go through all these experiences, and 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 why, what what did they mean? Why was I having them? And then understanding, you know, my my galactic history and the reason, the purpose, and the intent for me incarnating on on Mother Earth right now. So. I've come here for a specific purpose, and um, and I have a long history with these beings. So here here I am, just like everybody else. We've been stripped of our divinity, and we've uh, allowed ourselves to become totally vulnerable, and um, you know, um, to these forces of darkness and limitation, totally exposed um, to to their infrastructure, and and pretty much at their whim. You know, almost like they're rubbing their hands and going, "Oh, goody," you know, we haven't liked this being for a very long long time and look now we've got them right where we want them so they just go to town on us you know and and that's what they've done but we've uh, we've gotten through it there's a couple of areas I want to cover but first before I do that I wanted to ask you in terms of our transcript in terms of our conversation and, and what's you know what's come from this at this point is there any more comments that you'd like to add in, in a synopsis or overview that you um, I, I don't know much about reverse speech and I must say I'm, I'm incredibly impressed um, even if there's you know if there was negative things to come out it wouldn't have bothered me it uh, would have been a, a really good learning curve for me um, I, I have nothing to hide and uh, and I'm glad that you gave me this opportunity I really um, I really am very grateful and uh, it, it, if it's done anything for me, it's solidified and confirmed more than ever um, my life, what I've had to go through, and the role that I'm playing. So I, I really do appreciate it. And uh, the depth and the insights that you have, um, the techniques that you use, um, because there's a lot of others who have tried this reverse speech thing, and uh, and I don't know much about it, but somebody else did some reverse speech on me, and uh, I, I didn't feel that what they had said resonated with me, and it was on a shallow level. Um, but your insights are very deep, like really deep, very insightful, and um, and I want to thank you. It's been uh, it's been incredible uh, learning experience for me too.